Okay, so in this video, we're going to go over some of the basic chemistry behind water and some of the principles and properties of, of water molecules. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, a few basics about water. One of the most important features of water is that it's an example of what we call a polar molecule. Polar means that the molecule is one area of the molecule is slightly positive while another area of the same molecule is slightly negative. So water is a molecule and a portion of the water molecule will have a negative charge and, and another portion will have a positive charge. And let's show you how that works. So you should know that water is made from hydrogen and oxygen and the trick to water being polar is this right here. Oxygen is going to hog the electrons from hydrogen. Now oxygen normally has eight protons and eight electrons, but it's going to hog and kind of take two electrons from the two hydrogens, bringing its total up to 10. That's going to give it a negative charge. So if I uh, draw, first of all, two electrons on the inside electron level of oxygen in red and six electrons in the second level, because oxygen only has eight electrons total by itself eight electrons it's going to grab two more electrons for a total of 10 but on its own oxygen only has eight well now let's focus our attention for a moment on hydrogen hydrogen has one proton so that means it has one electron but my notes say that it has zero electrons well that mean that that's because after elect after oxygen kind of grabs the electron hydrogen really won't have any. So naturally, hydrogen has one blue electron there and then another blue electron. So hydrogen naturally has one electron. Well, you know what? Let's set these electrons in motion. And what I mentioned is that oxygen is going to grab those two electrons in blue from the hydrogen. So watch what I mean by that. Oxygen is going to grab those two electrons. And now it has a total of 10. It's got eight of its own, and then the ninth and 10th in blue that it just grabbed from hydrogen. So that's gonna give water its polarity. And again, what we mean by that, it has a positive, notice how the hydrogen now has a positive charge because it's got a proton, but no electrons. Oxygen now has a negative charge because it has eight protons, but 10 electrons. And so this creates what we call a hydrogen bond, where one water molecule sticks to another. And so here we have two water molecules bonded together with a hydrogen bond. And, you know, a big collection of water, it's just a big collection of these hydrogen bonds here. And so you can see in every hydrogen bond, the positive hydrogen is connected to the negative oxygen. When we look at a big container full of water, here we have a bunch of about eight water molecules, nine water molecules across the top, and I labeled them positive and negative. And when we look at uh, water, water is arranged in layers. You know, water has depth to it. And so when we look at the water molecules underneath the first layer, we can see how the positive, the positive hydrogens are connected and bonded to the negative oxygens. Same with the third level. The third layer of water is, you know, you can see the positive connected to the negative, and the same goes as we continue all the way down. So water arranges itself in this little configuration here uh, whenever you have a pool or a puddle or a container full of water. A couple properties to mention about water besides water being polar. Well, because water is polar, it has what's called a high specific heat. And this simply means that it will resist temperature changes. In the picture, you can see a, a pot of boiling water. So it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to break the bonds and boil water. In this case, in the picture, you know, it takes several minutes over an open flame to generate enough heat to, to make that water boil. Now, if we look at this little animation here, you can see a pot of water sitting on top of, uh, of an open flame. And what, what happens is as the temperature increases, the bonds in between the water molecules break. And as the bonds in between the water molecules break, you know, gas, water gas, water vapor, steam simply rises into the air. 
but uh, it, it takes energy to break those bonds that hold water molecules together. So because water's temperature is very difficult to change, this helps our body maintain a nice constant temperature. In, in the picture, we have some track and field athletes, you know, in, in the middle of doing a, a, an exercise, a run, but at the end of their race, you know, their body temperature really hasn't changed much, even though they were working very hard. Their bodies is made mostly from water, as is all of our bodies. And so because our bodies is made mostly from water, the temperature of our body just really doesn't change very much. And when our body temperature does change, you, you might end up in bed with a little bit of a temperature, a little bit of a fever, because again, our, our temperature is so vital to our health. Another feature I want to mention of water, because water is polar, it, uh, water has what's called cohesion. And, and we can see in this picture a great example of cohesion. So how come this paper clip is able to stay on top of water? You can see the paper clip is not falling through. Well, the answer is pretty straightforward, is that paper clip is not heavy enough. That paper clip does not have enough weight to break the hydrogen bonds that holds water molecules together. Cohesion is where one water molecule sticks to another and sticks to another and sticks to another and sticks to another. So when we look at a, that picture that we saw earlier, here's that picture from earlier, and if we put a big old paper clip on top of it, the paper clip is just not heavy enough to break apart the hydrogen bonds that, uh, that are attaching the individual water molecules together. And the final water property I want to mention, because water is polar, water has what's called adhesion. And so every year, sometimes students will mix up cohesion and adhesion. And cohesion is where water sticks to water. Adhesion is where water sticks to things other than water. And in this picture here, we have a red liquid filled into a graduated cylinder. And if you've ever seen this before, you might notice that there's a little dip in the, in the water level, in the liquid level. This dip, by the way, is called the meniscus. So if you're ever reading a graduated cylinder, do you read the bottom of the meniscus in this example where it says 25 milliliters, or do you read the top of the meniscus in this example where it says 29 milliliters? Well, I hope you know from, from experience, the answer is you would read the bottom. In this case, there's 25 milliliters of that red liquid. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up you can see adhesion in this example because the water inside of the graduated cylinder is sticking to the glass of the graduated cylinder and it's causing that little dip right there. So because of water's polarity, because of water, water has that polar charge, positive and negative charge, it's able to stick to things. So one thing I want to now shift our attention to is focus on solutions. If you've ever mixed up for instance, crystal light or Kool-Aid or lemonade, you've made, a, you've made yourself a homemade solution. A solution is a mixture. It's a mixture where one substance will dissolve in another substance. You might know that solutions are made from two parts. First part of a solution I want to mention is called the solute. These are the substances that are going to dissolve. In a biological solution, you might find atoms and ions and molecules. These are things that are dissolved inside of a solution. Now in my picture here, Crystal Light, Kool-Aid, Country Time Lemonade, you know, the, the powdered drinks, even powdered Gatorade, you know, you mix them with water. Well, what happens to the powder once you put it in water? The powder dissolves. The powder from these drinks right here is a great example of a solute. So the other part of a solution is what we call a solvent. It's the substance that is causing the solute to dissolve. And that's usually going to be water. Water is pretty much our universal solvent here. And so when we look at a, a silly example, a childhood example of a solution, here we have sugar mixed with Kool-Aid in our little container of water here. You know, you get a spoon and you stir it all together and what happens to the sugar? What happens to the Kool-Aid? They dissolve. They break apart and dissolve and you have a sweet sugary drink, uh, you know, from your childhood. But it, this is a great example of Kool-Aid and lemonade and Crystal Light. These are great examples of solutions. But what about biological 
A great example of a biological solution is simply our blood. You know, here's a picture of a test tube with a little stopper on it filled with blood. And a neat little thing you can do to separate the parts of blood is if you stick blood in a centrifuge, which is a machine that just spins the test tube around and around and around really, really fast, after a few moments, the blood, the, the components of blood will separate. And you can really see that blood is a great example of a solution. On top, you have the plasma, which is the watery part of the blood. Water, again, is pretty much our universal solvent. In the middle, we have a real thin layer of white blood cells, WBCs, and platelets. We'll talk more about white blood cells and platelets in another video. And at the bottom of the test tube are the heavier parts, the, the, the white, uh, excuse me, the red blood cells. And, and so you can really see that blood is a great example of a solution when, when, you, when you centrifuge it like this. Blood is made from solvent, which we said a moment ago, plasma is the watery part of blood that makes plasma, because it's mostly made from water, that makes plasma your solvent. And also, there are solutes in your blood, the carbohydrates, the proteins, the sugars. These are, all, these are all molecules that are dissolved in your plasma, in your watery part of your blood. Well, whenever we talk about solutions, of course, we're going to mention the pH scale. And so what the pH scale, it measures the amount of hydrogen ions that a solution contains. And you might know from the scale here that Everything below a 7 on the pH scale is considered an acid, and acids have more hydrogen ions. They, uh, and, and, but the above 7 is what we call a base. Well, bases have a lot of something else, just not hydrogen ions. You can see bases have very few hydrogen ions, but bases have a lot of what are called hydroxide ions. That's what the OH is a symbol for. It's an ion called hydroxide, made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Acids, you can see, have very few hydroxide ions. Right in the middle of our pH scale is our neutral 7. And you know, if we were in class, I would give you some time to, to try to answer these questions with your neighbor. If you're watching at home, pause the video and try to answer question A, B, and C. I'm going to go over the answer in three, two, one. Question A, which base has the most H plus hydrogen ions? I hope you see that's blood. Which base uh, is really only gives us three choices, blood, baking soda, and ammonia. Question B, which substance has the fewest hydrogen ions? From all, from all the choices, you can see that that would be ammonia. It's farthest to the right. And because it's farthest to the right, it has the fewest H plus hydrogen ions. Question C, which is the strongest acid? Well, there's really only three to choose from, lemons, soft drinks, and milk. Those are three acids. Which one is the strongest? Well, that would be lemons. And that's a little weird because you can see the pH of lemons is about 2.3 on the scale, and milk is 6.4. And we're used to bigger numbers being stronger, but in this case, the 2.3 is farther from neutral. That's why it's stronger. So moving on with our pH scale, when molecules are, uh, when substances are, are dissolved, they will often release hydrogen ions. And watch in this little animation here. We're going to put substance A into this container of, let's say, water. And over time, substance A is going to dissolve and release hydrogen ions. Well, this solution is now acidic. We said a moment ago from the pH scale, acids have a higher collection, a higher concentration of hydrogen ions. Well, the opposite is true with bases. If we put, for instance, substance B into this liquid here, and over time, substance B dissolves and releases those hydroxide, those OHs, this is what forms an alkaline solution or a basic solution. And one thing to mention about uh, the final thing I want to mention about pH is the reason we're talking about it in these notes is because we said that blood is a great example of a solution. And the pH of blood is really important and vital to our life. 
our notes say that blood's pH is naturally about 7.4. That makes blood a very, very weak, very, very weak base naturally. And what happens is if we do things to change the pH of our blood, proteins that are normally in our blood begin to break down and ultimately a person could die from this. So we want to, of course, avoid actions that cause our pH of blood to change. Well, one of the most common actions that causes the pH of blood to change is alcohol use. In this picture here, we see a blood vein with a nice balance of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. Again, normally blood is very slightly basic, but when a person abuses alcohol, uh, uh, you can see in my animation here, a, a larger collection of hydrogen ions begin to accumulate. As the person drinks more and more and more, their blood gathers more and more of these hydrogen ions. This makes their blood, instead of a nice 7.4, slightly basic, this brings the pH down into the acid range and ultimately can cause internal chemical reactions to stop and a person could actually die from alcohol poisoning if they drink too much. Well, uh, let's say that a person is at least drinking responsibly and they stop and over time, your kidneys are supposed to remove those excess amounts of hydrogen ions and that brings your pH back to normal. The, peop the problem is people who have a history, a lifetime of alcohol abuse often have kidney damage and so they're not able to remove those hydrogen ions and their blood pH can be off and that could cause some very serious health effects. And so as we wrap up this video, if you're in my biology class, pause the video. I'd be happy to check your answers for accuracy either before school or after school. So go ahead and pause the video and try to answer these. Good luck.